Okay, it looks like we're recording. And so today, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to begin our exploration of Plato's Apology. That's our first reading for this class. But there's one thing I wanted to cover before we move on to that. There's a famous uh, allegory, Plato's Allegory of the Cave, or sometimes it's referred to as the myth of the cave. And this is a good, uh, I, I guess you could say it's a good introduction to, to philosophy in general and a good introduction to the kind of thing, it's a metaphor, it's an allegory uh, for the kind of thing that I want us to, uh, the kind of journey that I would like us to try to take uh, this semester, at least metaphorically speaking. Um, and th this is a famous passage. Uh, I'm not going to read the passage. I'm just going to give you a brief summary of the this story. But it's famous. It's it's it comes from Plato's book, The Republic. And The Republic is maybe his most famous work. It's it's a very a long uh, series of dialogues. There's like ten dialogues, and ostensibly the subject matter of the Republic is justice, trying to define what justice is, what a just society uh, would be. But this allegory is from kind of the middle of the book where Socrates is talking about who should be in charge of this perfect just society. And he, um, he argues that the philosopher is the one who should be in charge of the society. And this gets quite a stir, right? A lot of the people that he's talking to say, well, that's not going to work. People aren't going to accept that because they don't, they don't have a very good view of philosophers. They see philosophers as, as either just useless. They, they're just people that, they, they have no use for society. All they do is just think about these abstract problems that don't have any bearing on everyday you know, practical problems, or uh, the philosopher was understood to be some sort of sneaky, sly, uh, uh, you, you know, vicious, I think is the word that, that is used in the Republic, uh, kind of individual who uses their intelligence to manipulate people. And so Socrates, um, he uses this allegory to try to explain why that's wrong. That 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 misconception of the philosopher is either useless or or evil, mischievous or whatever. Uh, that that's wrong. And so this story, it's it's an allegory. So what's an allegory? It's it's a, I mean, I mean, I guess a simple definition of an allegory for those who don't know. It's it's a story or a narrative that is representative of something else. It symbolizes something real and usually tells you some sort of moral or some sort of lesson uh, is supposed to be imparted through the telling of of an allegory. You might think about maybe, um, like one example could be, I, I mean, Jesus's parables have a similar function. If you're familiar with the, uh, uh, the parables from the, the Gospels in the, the New Testament in the Bible, uh, you know, he, he, Jesus uses a, a story, it, it's, it's a, maybe a fictitious or, or an allegorical story, but it's supposed to tell you a spiritual truth. So this is what's going on here in the allegory of the cave, sometimes called the myth of the cave. And there's quite a there's quite a lot of layers. There's quite there's there's quite a few layers, and many ways that one can interpret this story. We're not going to explore all of them, of course, because we're just not going to have time for that. But we we, we probably actually once we get through um, our exploration of Plato, once we get towards the end of the symposium, we might come back to this story because I, I think it'll take on a broader context and a broader meaning. But for now, let's just listen to it. Let me tell you the story, this allegory of the cave, and at least get us sort of started on some sort of understanding or interpretation of what's going on here. Now, as I mentioned, this, this story comes from his Republic, Plato's Republic, this larger, more politically focused work. But it's usually, this, this story is seen mostly as a metaphysical allegory. It's telling us about reality, something about the nature of the fundamental nature of reality. So it's a, it, it's a metaphysical lesson. But you'll see when I get through the story, I think there's elements of all sorts of ethical and, and political uh, and maybe other type of lessons that we can draw uh, from the story, maybe epistemological having to do with knowledge. So when Socrates is, is explaining uh, to his friends 
just why the philosopher should be in charge of the city and why the philosopher is the one who is most fitted to be the king. He starts to describe this situation um, of some prisoners. He says, you know, imagine there are these prisoners who have been held captive their entire life. So all they really know is their imprisonment. And they've been kept down in this deep, dark cave. So here we have, you know, here I have this, this picture that I found on Google image, uh, Google image search of uh, Plato's allegory. We see our prisoners here down towards the, the bottom left. You know, you've got these guys, they're all chained up with their backs against this brick wall. And so in the story, you know, Socrates makes it clear that they're not able to turn around. They're not able to see anything behind them. All they are able to see is this wall in front of them. And behind, behind them, you know, behind the rest of the cave is illuminated by this bonfire. So there's this fire up here. And every once in a while, but not always, there's a procession that comes out behind the wall. See all these men, they're carrying uh, these sticks, these staffs. And at, you know, at the top, there's, there are these little, um, I don't know, you might call them silhouettes or puppets. So every once in a while, this procession will walk out and it'll be in between the, the light of the fire and the wall, the back wall of the cave that the prisoners are staring at. So occasionally they're going to see these shadows projected on the wall. And at this point in the story, um, Socrates gets interrupted and his friend says, what, a, what strange prisoners, what a strange condition that they're in. And Socrates says, it's not strange at all. It's just like us. So as I said, this is an allegory that Plato is giving to us. And when Socrates says that it's just like us, he's making it pretty clear that this is an allegory. This is supposed to teach us a lesson that somehow, and, and so, so maybe think about this, somehow we are also like prisoners in this cave staring at shadows on the wall. So if you were one of these prisoners in the cave and you're, you're spending your whole life looking at these shadows that are projected onto the wall, would you be really aware that these are shadows that you're looking at? Socrates reasons that no, you would really not know that they're shadows. It's not like you would look at this shadow here and say, oh, that's the shadow of a vase and there's a shadow of a horse. And there's the shadow of a ring or a circle or whatever. And there's a shadow of a bird. No, you would just say, that's a vase. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a vase. That's a horse. That's a ring. You would think that that is actually what's real. You wouldn't think of it as a shadow. That would be your reality. Because you wouldn't know anything else. Socrates says, well, imagine perhaps that one of our prisoners here is able to get free. You know, maybe they wake up. They wake up one morning, their chains have been loosened and they're able to turn their head around and see around the wall. And then they're able to sort of get, get free of their chains. And for the first time, they're able to see the procession and the fire and all the rest of the cave dwelling. And this has gotta be unsettling. You, you gotta imagine that somebody who is seeing this for the first time, is probably going to be pretty uncomfortable. It's not going to be a, 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 a very pleasant experience. What do you mean? All I've been looking at my whole life are just shadows? This is ridiculous. I thought this was reality. This is not reality. These shadows are a distortion of the puppets. They look somewhat like the puppets, but they're these sort of elongated, distorted forms of the puppets. And they're being caused by the fire in the cave. Eventually, our hero uh, gets out of the cave. So there's this very narrow, steep passageway. And eventually, the, the prisoner is able to get, get out of the cave completely and escape to the surface. And is, for the first time, able to see the world above. And you got to imagine that just like in the first step, when he breaks the chains, 
This is also very unsettling and probably even more unsettling than the first trip, right? The first time he turned his head around was pretty unsettling. But getting to the surface and seeing the sun for the first time, you know, imagine that, you, you know, you've been in a cave your whole life and now you got to deal with the bright, bright sunlight. Socrates describes this experience as blinding. He's blinded by the light of the sun. He's unable to see anything at first because it's all just one flash of light. For Plato, this sun is supposed to represent the light of the good and the light of the good is supposed to, um, the light of the good was suppo is supposed to illuminate everything else. You, you can understand the universe if you understand the good. You can understand uh, what it means to be good. You can understand why things are the way they are. But we'll talk more about that later when we get to sort of Plato's metaphysics. But the point is, once I get out of the cave, it's supposed to be this experience of, of full, full knowledge of how everything connects. And obviously this... Um, this can't be the end of the story. At least Plato doesn't think so. Once the prisoner gets out of the cave, once the prisoner is able to see the light of the sun and, and see reality for what it really truly is, not this distorted shadow reality, he's got to go back. So... He goes back to the cave, he crawls down into that tunnel, and he wants to, to tell everybody else what's up. He wants to illuminate them. He wants to, to guide them. But this is a bit of a struggle for him because, uh, you know, just imagine, now he's used to the sunlight. Now he's used to the surface. And now he's got to go back down to the darkness. His eyes have to readjust. And not only that, but he has to talk about things to his friends down here, these prisoners, who know about nothing but shadows and aren't even aware that they're looking at shadows. They think that these shadows are actually the truth, that these are what are real, not a shadow of what's real. So you can imagine he's going to have a lot of trouble. He's going to get down there. It's going to be so dark. He'll be tripping all over the place, bumping into walls. Hey, guys, how you doing? Boom, falling over, bumping his head all over the place, talking about clouds and trees and all sorts of things they've never heard of. They're going to think he's nuts. They're going to think he's crazy. They're not going to understand him. So there's a couple of points I think Plato's making here. One, you got to go back to the cave. It's, it's almost a moral imperative. Uh, some, and I think this is a good interpretation, but I think, you know, some people interpret Plato's ethics as basically based on knowledge. To know the good is to do the good. So if you want to be a good person, if you want to be an ethical, moral person, you want to be a wise person. Because if you're wise, if you're intelligent and you're, you have understanding, then you can understand what it means to be good and you can understand what it means to be a good person. And he also assumes that to know, to know that, if you knew what that was, if you knew what it was to truly be good, then you would naturally be that way, that you would want to be good. So when the prisoner escapes the cave and is able to see truth and see how everything fits together, they immediately want to do the right thing. And that's to, to, to make others wise, to, make, to guide others out of ignorance into the light of knowledge and understanding. But the problem is this understanding that, that the prisoner gains when they emerge from the cave is not something that can just be taught through explanation, through, through some sort of, you know, rational explanation. I mean, it maybe could be explained this way, but the, the individual who is going to understand and have this understanding uh, that the prisoner that escapes has, they have to take the journey themselves. It's not enough for the prisoner to go down there and to explain to them, hey, there's this wall behind you. Behind that wall is a fire. And here's what a fire is. Let me explain a fire. And there's these guys holding puppets. And let me explain what a puppet is. That's not going to work. You're going to hit resistance the whole way. 
and they're not going to want to listen to you. Some people also, I guess you could say, are comfortable in their illusions. So one lesson I think he's trying to teach here is that the, the best you can do is when you get back down to the cave is you can guide their soul in the right direction. You can point their soul in the right direction. And the way that Socrates, who is, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about Socrates in a minute, but he's sort of Plato's hero. You know, Socrates used the so what we call now call the Socratic method. He would question people instead of telling them, here's what truth is, and this is what you should believe, he asked them, so this is what you think. Why do you think that? What is the basis for your belief? And getting them to think and really question the basis for their belief, this perhaps is what Plato might have in mind when he talks about pointing one's soul in the right direction. So I mentioned at the outset of the allegory when we first began telling when I first began telling the story that Socrates says we're all in a similar situation as the prisoners. You know, when, when his friend was like, this is a weird scenario, how strange. And he says, not strange at all. It's just like us. You know, what do you think he means by this? You know, how is it that we're prisoners in a cave staring at shadows? Plato seems to have, you know, have this idea that all of us, at least we start out this way as children in the world, when we're brand new and we're just experiencing life, that in a way we're just like these prisoners, that we just kind of accept the reality that is presented to us without asking questions and, 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 and getting at sort of the cause behind what we're seeing. So who is supposed to be presenting us with these versions of reality for lack of a better word you know who is it in other words that is using these puppets to present a certain version of truth to the prisoners now plato he most certainly had politicians in mind he was very skeptical of political power uh this is one reason he thought philosophers should be king the kings because philosophers didn't care about power philosophers didn't care about wealth and honor and, and and pleasure the philosopher cares about truth and justice and so they would rule for the right reasons they would rule over the populace for the right reasons but plato typically saw most politicians were just power hungry and all they cared about was glory and honor and wealth and so they would they would uh, manipulate the population they would they would you know, use propaganda to try to tell them false stories about what they should and shouldn't do and what they should and shouldn't like and what they should and shouldn't value. And so for Plato, you know, it's the politicians mainly, I think, who are represented here. You know, the government is, is presenting this false image of what's really going on and kind of brainwashing the people to submission, to doing uh, what, what they want. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Um, it's not that Plato actually thought that was necessarily a bad thing. You know, I've seen this, this allegory of the cave. I've seen this used by a lot of different people uh, in different, you know, media. Like, I, you know, you hear this story told on uh, political commentators will use it sometimes. And, you know, when you first hear the story, a lot of people kind of fall in love with it. They think this is great. You know, he's basically telling you to think about things and, and, and not to just take what you're given and, and to question authority and, and, and to take the journey out of this cave of ignorance into the light of truth. And, and so it's a very inspiring story. And especially, you know, going back down to the cave to help others to take the journey themselves. So it sounds very noble. But we have to keep in mind that Plato actually thought that there were some people that just would never get out of the cave. That there were certain types of people who, no matter how hard you tried, they're never going to turn their soul in the right direction. They're always going to be living through lies and illusions, and they're never going to be able to see the full light of the truth. Only the philosopher that, that takes that journey and has this, the type of soul that, that seeks truth for its own sake that that rare type very rare he thought only they were the ones that could really see everything and they were the ones that really should be in control of the propaganda so 
it's not that Plato was against it. He actually thought that we should have a very authoritarian um, government ruled by these enlightened philosophers who they were authoritarian, but yet at the same time, they had our best interest in mind. And so um, they would guide as many people out of the cave as possible, but those that couldn't be guided, you know, they'd have to tell them, uh, you know, what Plato called a noble lie to guide them towards truth. It's a lie, it's not factually correct, but it leads them towards truth. You know, maybe tell them something like, oh, just be a good boy and Zeus will give you a reward in the afterlife. You know, maybe Plato didn't even believe that, <laughs> excuse me, but that's okay. Some people aren't gonna do the right thing because it's the right thing. You have to sort of entice them with some sort of reasons. So, but yeah, I mentioned politicians here, right? That Plato, you know, he has politicians primarily in mind when he's talking about these puppet masters, the ones who control uh, the shadows on the wall. Uh, but you might, I mean, personally, I think there's a lot of things that could fit into this allegory here. It's, at least in modern day society, you could think of things like, heck, I think the media plays even a bigger role of course, I think a lot of the media is basically government propaganda, <laughs> especially we watch like mainstream news outlets nowadays. But like, uh, still, I think, you know, our media that we consume, uh, you know, movies and stuff like this, uh, our parents, I think, do it. They do it maybe to, you know, because, um, you know, our parents might do this because we're children and we can't understand everything about the world. So they have to sort of like give us the sugar coated version of it till we're old enough to fully understand it. So that's maybe not so nefarious, but in a way your, your parents, you know, or whoever, you know, whoever raised you, uh, you know, that person probably when you were young, they gave you a certain version of the world and it wasn't completely false, but that's another thing too, we should also emphasize about the story. It's not that these shadows are completely false, Right, the shadow of the vase, it looks like the actual vase. It's longer, bigger, a little distorted, but it, there's some kernel of truth. It looks like the vase. Um, and so, you know, the version of the, the world that maybe your, your, your parents or whoever raised you, it might not be absolutely true, but maybe it's based on truth and, and sort of a, again, a kind of sugar coated version of the truth. But uh, Lola wrote in the comments, I guess we are all prisoners, the cave is the human condition. Yeah, I think that that's, Plato would say to a certain extent that's true, that we're all stuck in this condition, but we can get out of it somewhat through philosophy, through understanding the reasons behind something. And, and I use the example of media because I think that one is very instructive. And it kind of gets at my point of why I went over this lecture today and, and, and why I'm, why I cover it at the beginning of the semester, every semester, you know, I, I watch a lot of news and, and, and so, and when I watch the news, I watch it from a lot of different sources and I recommend you try this at least once. I don't know if some of y'all, I think most people get their news. Unfortunately, most people get their news from their social media feed. That's really horrible. Most people just read the headline. They'll read the first few paragraphs at best of the articles. And I hate to tell you, but if you're doing that, you are a prisoner in a cave. Like you are literally one of these guys. You are looking at what is being presented to you and you need to go out there and look and go find new sources that maybe you don't agree with, right? Maybe find, if you're a, if you're a Democrat, Go watch, go watch the Republican news channel. Go watch the Demo or the conservative. You know, if you're conservative, go watch the liberal news network. I, I guarantee you will be surprised. You'll be very surprised. And, you know, I don't really think th that like Fox News or MSNBC, they don't really lie. I mean, they do sometimes. They do. I've, I've seen them like just straight up lie, right? But a lot of times they don't lie. They don't just say something false. But what they'll do is they won't give you the full version of the truth, right? They'll just give you the partial version. You know, if you if you watch MSNBC, for instance, you're not going to hear any neg anything negative or you're going to hear very little negative about anything Joe Biden's done, right? They're going to ignore all that stuff, right? And if anything negative that, you know, the people on the right have done, they're going to report that for sure. And they're going to report it a lot. And that the opposite is true on Fox. You know, if there's any negative things about Trump, they're not going to mention that. They're not going to say anything bad about Trump. 
because they know their viewers want to hear it. That's what the viewers want to hear. Maybe that's another reason why it's so hard for the person who's, who's escaped from the cave. It's very difficult for them to get back to the others and to get those others to take that journey out because the others, when they hear this, sometimes they'll hear stuff they don't want to, they don't want to believe. They like this illusion. They like these shadows they've been looking at and that gives them comfort. Uh, and so uh, again, this is not gonna be very comfortable sometimes. You have to question your own basic assumptions. You know, and personally, I feel like we're all in a very um, pre precarious situation in our day and age with our access to all these different media, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's almost hard to know what to believe now. You watch all these different news outlets and you're like, I don't even know who to believe at this point. Uh, but personally, I think you know, the, the best thing you can do is to at least understand that every one of them is going to be imperfect and kind of understand that when you're watching Fox, you know it's going to be definitely slanted towards the right. And if you're going to be watching MSNBC, you know it's going to be pro-left or pro-Democrat. Uh, and just sort of be aware of that and sort of take that into consideration, right? Where are these people coming from? What's their agenda? Do they have a bias? And also, don't forget, we all have our own bias. We all have our own. Maybe there's things that you, you tend to want to believe. And so, you know, when you hear something that you want to believe, you know, think about it and be like, well, do I believe that because I want to or because it's actually plausible? You know, and this is something that's hard to do. It's not easy. It requires a lot of self-reflection. Um, you know, and, and uh, Angelic Thomas, she says, I agree, we don't develop our own perceptions, we can be conditioned to believe anything. Yeah, that's, I think that's definitely true. And that reminds me, what is the quote? Um, oh, Malcolm X, I think Malcolm X said something. He said, uh, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. You know, it's like, it's kind of, I don't know if that's exactly the same sentiment, but it's similar. If you, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. You know, if you just believe what you believe because you just feel like it, because it just, you, you want to, then you're going to believe anything that anything like that, anything that makes that pleases you, you're going to fall for it. And so you'll fall for all sorts of con artists. I, honestly, I mean, no offense, but I think that's why a lot of people vote for who they vote for. They vote for them because they believe whatever bullshit they hear. I promise you this. I'm going to give you this. I'll do this when I'm elected. They never do. And you still fall for it. A lot of times they make promises that they, they know they can't keep. So yeah, I think that again, if you, uh, you don't really think about, you know, why do I believe this? What's the reason behind it? Um, your, your beliefs are kind of based on nothing. And if you stand for nothing, as Malcolm X once said, you fall for anything. Um, so, okay, enough about the allegory of the cave. As I said, we, we will come back to the allegory uh, later in the semester uh, once we get uh, closer to the end of Plato. I'm really surprised how long it took me to get through that. I had a, uh, had fun with it, I guess, which is weird because usually I, you know, uh, I usually don't just straight lecture. I usually try to get more class discussion going, and and uh, uh, for some reason it took longer to do it this way. The reason I'm commenting on that is because I'm noticing that it's already almost 40 minutes after. And I want to try to get this lecture uh, done within about 45 minutes. So we started a bit late. So I want to, you know, I want to give it maybe maybe about 10 or 15 minutes. Let's spend uh, getting started on Plato's Apology, and then we'll wrap things up. And then I'll take roll and give you guys credit for being here. Um, one thing I want to cover before we get to the actual reading, just a little bit of background. Um, there are a group of men who were contemporaries of Socrates. Some of them were older than Socrates. Some of them were about his age and some were a bit younger, but there were a group of men in ancient Greece called the Sophists. And I don't think they're mentioned by name in your reading, in the Apology, but they're, they're alluded to right at the beginning. I think Plato is making a reference to them. So I want to, I want to talk about them a little bit briefly. Uh, Protagoras was one of them. That's why I have his name up here. I guess Protagoras is maybe the most famous of the Sophists, but the Sophists were famous uh, for, they were pretty wealthy, most of them. Uh, and they got a lot of their wealth from what you might call being a tutor or a teacher. Uh, so they went around to wealthy families and they, they would charge a fee to, to, to teach their sons 
mainly the art of rhetoric. That was sort of their their specialty. That wasn't the only thing. What what they would basically say that their sort of advertisement was, you know, we'll teach you how to um, uh, benefit yourself, how to harm your enemies, how to make sure that no harm comes to your friends and family, and that you benefit them as well, and uh, that you're able to manage your your public and private affairs uh, with excellence. And um, they thought that rhetoric was the key to all that in order to like get what you wanted to make sure you weren't harmed make sure no harm came to yourself in a civilized society rhetoric was the key now what is rhetoric um then there's different ways of defining rhetoric but in this context what we're talking about here is using language using speech to persuade using style to persuade to get some sort of reaction to to get uh, to elicit a certain response now, why would people spend all sorts of money and go into debt sometimes in order to learn how to speak this way, how to speak persuasively? How is that useful to be a persuasive speaker? Well, I guess you could say there were some obvious political advantages to that. If you were persuasive, you could get some people to vote for you in the Senate. You could become a politician. Um, and also maybe the, the, the less obvious is that uh, in the court of law, when you were defending yourself in a trial, you didn't get a lawyer. So if you were not convincing, if you weren't eloquent, if you weren't able to convince the jury, you weren't really going to have a good chance of being acquitted. And so um, you'll see, you know, in, in, in the, the apology, Plato's apology, it's the story of Socrates on trial and he has to defend himself. And, if he, and again, it doesn't even matter if he's innocent or guilty. If he can't speak persuasively, well, then he's kind of shit out of luck, pardon my French. You know, he's, he's not going to be able to get, get, get himself acquitted. So rhetoric was a skill that was seen as useful. Now, if you're learning how to be persuasive, if you're learning how to convince people to do what you want them to do or to not do certain things, um, do you really think truth is that important? uh maybe not and in fact depending on who you believe it seems like some of these sophists didn't they either didn't have much respect for truth or according to plato some of them didn't even believe there was such a thing as truth that all truth was just belief it was just there is no absolute truth it's all just relative we talked a little bit about relativism uh last class you know, there are no objective truths. Everything is just matter of relative beliefs and feelings. So if you've got two men who are standing outside and a gust of wind comes by, you know, one of them says that it's cold. The other says it's hot. Protagoras says it's neither. It's cold to him and hot to the other. There's no absolute truth. It's all, it's all just relative, right? Well, you know, for them, you know, even if there is truth, and I think this is probably a more likely uh, description of their belief, because absolute relativism is kind of absurd, but the idea is even if there is truth, it doesn't matter, right? For, 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 for Protagoras, what really matters is what is going to be good for you. And so sometimes lying is going to be good for you. Sometimes telling the truth might be good for you. So that's that's doesn't matter. But what's always going to be good is that you're able to be persuasive and to get your way. That's always going to be at least good for you. And so this the art of rhetoric was supposed to be able to, to hone your skills and your capacity to speak persuasively and to get what you wanted. Now, when you get to people like Socrates showing up and, and who was this guy? Uh, you know, we don't know a whole lot about him. Most of what we know about him, we know through Plato, the guy who did all the writings about Socrates. There are a couple other sources. You got uh, uh, Xenocrates was a historian back then who wrote about Socrates, who knew him. Uh, who is it? Aristophanes, the playwright, didn't like Socrates very much at all, but you know he wrote a play making fun of him. In fact, they, they mention it in the Apology. Uh, it's uh, it's actually quoted a couple times. Uh, so Socrates never wrote anything himself, but he had a deep influence on Western thought, and people consider him the father of Western philosophy by many accounts. 
he's on trial here in this first reading and you can already see from the get-go that he's opposing himself to this approach of the sophist he doesn't think of truth as something relative you know it's not and, and when we talk about relative truth most people think about when we think about oh truth is relative there's no absolute truth what most people when they say that what they really have in mind is is ethical truth moral truth you know there's no right or wrong it's all conventional um you obviously, you know, some people, there might be some crazy crazies that think even mathematical truths are relative, but most people think that, you know, scientific mathematical truths, they're just true, right? They don't, you know, they don't, they don't uh, depend on culture, right? A circle is 360 degrees, whether you want it to be or not, whether you were raised in Sparta or Athens, a circle is 360 degrees, a triangle, all the angles on the inside, they all add up to 180 degrees. It does not because of convention, it's because of the nature of triangles. And so when you get to things like mathematical truths and scientific truths, it's, it's hard to argue that those are relative in an absolute sense. But when it comes to ethics, it seems kind of fuzzy, but Plato and Socrates, they seem to actually argue that no, it's not just mathematical truth. It's not just truth about geometrical shapes. It's not just truth about, you know, the properties of water and, and other substances under con certain conditions. That's not the only kind of truth that's absolute. There are actually real answers, true answers to what is right, to what is wrong, to what is just, what is unjust, what's good and what's evil. There are not relative, but absolute truths uh with regard to these questions and so uh many people uh will often um you know and I, I think rightly so a lot of people will characterize the sophists as kind of the arch rivals the arch nemeses of plato and socrates socrates and plato are here to instill eternal values eternal truths and to guide society towards order and towards reason, whereas the sophists are selfish, self-serving, and don't believe in order, right? They are, the, they are decadent. They are gonna destroy civilization. Okay, so let's just, again, get briefly started on the apology. I'm not gonna get very far because we're, we're almost out of time. Um, but let's just, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the title. For those of you who started doing the reading, you know, maybe you got a, a good way into it. You might be confused why the hell they called it the apology. Why did Plato call it the apology? It doesn't, it definitely does not seem like Socrates is being very apologetic. In fact, quite the opposite. He's being very direct. He's saying things that are going to probably upset quite a few people. And it's not a very apologetic tone. So, if you read the footnotes, I think you could probably see, at least I think on page one, there's a footnote explaining this. Um, the word apology is not a translation. It's what you would call a transliteration. It sounds like the original word, but it's not a translation of that original word. So the original word, the Greek word is apologia, which, which literally means legal defense. So this is Socrates' defense. It's his legal defense. I guess that just doesn't sound as cool as apology. And so it, I think it's just aesthetics, right? The people who translated this and just called it Plato's apology, it just sounds cooler. That's the only reason, right? But definitely it's, it's not um, apologetic. You know, as, as Chrissy says in the comments, he seems to blame people for for his wrongs but I, I don't even know if, i don't even know if that's a good way to characterize it chrissy because he doesn't seem to think he's actually done wrong that it's actually them that have done wrong and they actually we're going to see not today uh by the time we get to the end of the reading we're going to see that he actually seems to be convinced that he's done them right he's actually helped them and he's improved them and that they should actually reward him for all that he's done for the city so um let me read, I'm gonna read the opening lines here. Uh, and then we'll talk about the charges against him and kind of how he begins his defense. But let me read, I'm gonna read the very opening lines of the apology. So if you, ha if you have your handout, your, your, your reading, uh, just start right at the top. 
So Socrates says, and I guess this, this is after his accusers have just finished talking about how bad he is and all the horrible things he's done. And here's his first response. He says, I do not know, men of Athens, how my accusers affected you. As for me, I was almost carried away in spite of myself. So persuasively did they speak. And yet hardly anything of what they said is true. Of the many lies they told, one in particular surprised me, namely that you should be careful not to be deceived by an accomplished speaker like me, that they were not ashamed to be immediately proved wrong by the facts when I show myself not to be an accomplished speaker at all. That, I thought, was most shameless on their part, unless indeed they call an accomplished speaker the man who speaks the truth. So the first thing he does here at the very outset is he distinguishes himself from his accusers. And how does he, how does he distinguish? What makes him different from his accusers? It's his manner of speech. It's the way he talks. They speak persuasively and he speaks the truth, okay? And this is obviously, I mean, after I just got done explaining the sophist, this is obviously an allusion to the sophist. They speak persuasively. He's not here to persuade you. He's not here to lie to you to get his way. He's here to tell you the truth. And he also says, I'm not gonna read the rest of that passage, but he also says, I know you're not gonna wanna hear this. I'm gonna speak in a way that you're not accustomed to hearing people talk about on trial. I'm going to speak to you just real. I'm going to keep it real, basically, is kind of what he's saying. And this might be hard to accept. And I would argue, I think it'd be pretty easy to argue, there might be some alternative interpretations of Plato. But I personally would argue, I'd be able to put some money on this, that, that for me, one of the most important themes that you're going to find in Plato, and this theme runs throughout all of Plato, not just in this but almost, almost everything he ever wrote. There's this distinction, this dichotomy between appearance and reality. And there are things that appear to be real, just like those shadows appear to be real to the prisoners in the cave. And they're very persuasive. They feel real if you were raised in that cave, but they're not. There's actually a, a, a deeper truth and so this idea of appearance versus reality and appearance being very persuasive and reality being something that needs to sort of be worked out and something that has to be explored and revealed through introspection and through uh, reasoning. You know, this is something, like I said, that you're going to find that, that not only runs throughout this whole uh, argument of, of Socrates that you're going to see here in the trial, but throughout all of Plato's philosophy. So why is Socrates on trial, right? We're, we're gonna get to his defense later. We'll probably have to wait um, till the next lecture to really get into it. But what's he being accused of? There, there are a lot of things that he lists. There are a lot of accusations that, accusations that he throws out if you do the reading. But you can kind of sum them up into these two main charges. The first one is that he is accused of being impious. So impiety is one charge. What does that mean? To be pious, it means to be respectful of your religion, to be respectful of spiritual truths or respectful of, of the gods. And so he's not being respectful of the, the religion of Athens, which was, you know, what we would call paganism. You know, they believed in all the Greek gods. And so they believe that Socrates is disrespecting the gods. He's not uh, respecting them. He's teaching new teachings and, and he should be uh, uh, punished for this. And the second thing, because of all this, because of his impiety and because he spends all his time going around and talking to people about all these wacky ideas, that he's, le he's, he's um, setting a bad example. And he's very popular with, with the kids, the, the youth. All the young people of Athens, they like Socrates. They like to watch him question others. And so they think that because of this, Socrates is corrupting the youth. So those are the two charges that he's facing. Uh, that's what he has to sort of deal with. And how does he begin his, um, 
his defense. This is kind of odd. And it always, it always throws you off maybe the first time you read the apology. You're kind of wondering, uh, you know, this is interesting. I, I kind of like this story that he's telling us about the Oracle, but isn't he kind of wasting time? Like he's being accused of some serious charges. He's facing a death penalty. Why is he telling us his life story? Because that seems like that's pretty much what he's doing. Um, Lola says in the comments, he makes the worse appear the better cause, right? I think the actual wording is that he makes the, the worse argument appear better. Uh, and that's something a sophist would do, right? That you would, you know, use like really w wacky logic to, uh, you know, make some argument appear worse when it actually is better and, and vice versa, you know? But, uh, but certainly, I guess you could, you could uh, throw that in the pile with corrupting the youth, right? He's misleading them. He, he's showing them false ideas, making the, the better argument appear worse and the worse argument appear better and all that sort of thing. Um, but his first, his first line of fence is just to sort of to talk about his reputation. He says, you know, I think I know why I had this reputation. It all started with a certain kind of wisdom, as he puts it. I learned something about myself and it made me start thinking and it made me start questioning and it made me start becoming the kind of philosopher that I am. And what, what was this that he heard? What was this certain kind of wisdom? Well, he had a friend uh, and his friend had a brother and his friend's brother went to go visit the Oracle, the Oracle at Delphi to be specific. Now an oracle to the Greeks, uh, an oracle is, it, it was usually a woman. I don't think there were any male oracles back then. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was always a priestess. And it was believed that she spoke for the gods or, or that the gods spoke through her. This particular oracle, the oracle at Delphi, she was um, thought to speak for Apollo. So her oracles were often considered the most important because it's not that Apollo, if you, if you know anything about Greek mythology, you, you might know Zeus is considered sort of the king of the Olympian gods, so he's the highest one. Uh, but, so why was Apollo, why was the oracle at Delphi so important? Because Apollo was associated with truth. Apollo was associated with honesty. Apollo was the god of light, the sun god, and he hated lying, he hated truth. So the idea was that if, if the oracle at Delphi said it, it had to be true. The oracle at Delphi would not lie. So again, one of Socrates' friends, uh, Cherophon, had a brother who went to go visit the oracle. And when he went to go visit the oracle, he asked the oracle, he said, are there any wiser than Socrates, right? Is anyone wiser than Socrates? And the oracle told him, no, there are none wiser than Socrates. And so Socrates was actually very confused about this. He didn't let it go to his head like I probably would have, you know. Oh, yeah, I guess I am pretty smart. Jeez, I guess I am the wisest. I mean, I knew I was smart. Right? I know I was the wisest, but hey, I guess I'm pretty. Yeah, I, I probably would have been Mr. Ego over here, but not Mr. Socrates. He was confused. And he was also aware that the Oracle would often speak in riddles. You know, there's a famous story of how the Oracle once told this Greek king uh, that if he went to go invade Persia, that a great empire would fall. And so that king got all excited and went to go invade Persia, and his empire fell. Not the Persian empire, but his own. And so um, often the oracle will say things that are ambiguous. They can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, and so it's not obvious how to interpret them. And so this is how Socrates takes it. He says, I'm the wisest? There's no way. There's got to be people who are wiser than me. There must be some deeper meaning to what the oracle has to say. So Socrates decides that he has to go investigate. And so what he does is he goes to question the politicians. He goes to question the poets, the artists, the creative types. And then he goes to the craftsmen, those who have a technical skill, you know, the carpenters and craftsmen of 
all sorts of the blacksmiths and the people who build ships. <clears throat> and he starts to realize what the oracle meant. And he starts to realize why it is that the oracle said that there are none wiser uh, than Socrates. But it isn't obvious at first. So we'll actually cover that next class. I'll go in and end our lecture here. And then our next meeting, we'll talk a little bit more about Socrates' journey, his encounters with the politicians, with the poets, with all the craftsmen. And we'll see what actually the oracle meant and why was it that Socrates is the wisest? And also more importantly, maybe, what does this have to do with his defense? How is this a defense against his, the accusations that he's not being pious, that he's corrupting the youth? It's not quite obvious on the face of it. So we'll have to answer those questions at the next lecture, which will be um, Thursday at 1 p.m. So there's a link for that on the Blackboard website. Um, you don't have to show up. I will be posting the recording of it uh, on, on our Blackboard website, but you are free to join uh, for the one point extra credit. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now.